Let's go ahead and take a look at doing a little bit of momentum review in here. Hopefully you feel really confident already, but um, hopefully this will help you even more. Uh, so the definition of momentum, real easy. Uh, if you if you are familiar with the formula, if you're not super familiar, oh my goodness, if you're not super familiar with the formula, uh, it can be something that's a little bit more of a challenge. But basically, it's just mass and motion, right? If we look at the formula, this p equals p equals m v, or really rho equals m v. We've got mass, we've got velocity, which represents our motion, so mass in motion. All right, the thing that affects the momentum of objects we already know is impulse. Let me get a uh, pencil out here. But um, impulse is the thing that actually changes it. The thing that affects it, if we look at the formula, is either, either mass or velocity, like we saw before. But we could also say, well, wait a second, impulse is the thing that actually creates a change in momentum. And we know that an impulse is a force times a time. So really a force or a period of time could also change our momentum as well, which would also be something that affects um, momentum. So a number of ways that you could look at that particular problem. From the most basic level though, if you change mass or you change velocity, you change momentum. A little bit more advanced level, if we know that impulse is the thing that's changing momentum, then we know that impulse is a force and a time, then also force or time can change momentum as well. All right. For the three types of collisions and what makes them unique, we know that we've got elastic, inelastic, and explosion interactions. Like we would say, we would really call it an explosion collision, that'd be sort of an oxymoron. But um, elastic collisions, remember that's where you have a couple of objects and they, they knock into each other somehow. And then afterwards, you still have a couple of objects. They haven't like stuck together or anything like that. Um, so you have essentially four momenta that you're dealing with, right? Each one of these objects would get its own M, M and V, right? Its own momentum. If we were to look at this from a graphical perspective, we would have a, an object that is going at its own velocity, one of these. Then we would have a, another object going at its own velocity like that. And then we would see that there's some sort of collision that occurs in the mathematical formula that represent, that's represented by equal sign. On our graph, the collision would occur between those two flat lines. Right? Flat line just means that our velocity is staying constant. Nothing has happened quite yet to cause a change in velocity or a change in momentum. Once we see this, this line start to decrease, that means that a collision has occurred. And collisions aren't instant. This entire time that we see this sort of X pattern here, that is how long it is taking for the collision to occur. And we don't know how long it's taking for it to occur because we don't have any numbers here, but we do know that it is not instant. All right, inelastic collisions and explosions are basically the reverse of one another. Inelastic collisions, you have a couple of masses that are going at um, different velocities, they could be going in the same direction. One ends up rear-ending the other. They could be going in opposite directions. One ends up going this way, the other goes this way, and they actually collide with each other head-on. It uh, doesn't, doesn't matter in the end um, what direction they're going, but we do know that in the end they collide and they somehow stick together. In class I gave the morbid example, I guess, of a car accident. You know, if it's bad enough, the two cars can kind of become entangled and move, slide, or skid as if they were one object, and that would be an example of an, an inelastic collision. Uh, not a nice example, but a but a good example nonetheless. Um, when we look at this from a graphical perspective, which we did that just relatively recently in class, we would be able to represent one of our objects with uh, one of those one of those velocities, one of those lines. The other object would be the other. Again, the equal sign is where a collision occurs. So in this case, the equal sign would be right there. We know that the collision's occurring here because that's where our velocity is changing. So in order for our velocity to have changed, something must have had to have happened. And then it stops changing when those lines come back to uh, back together there. All right. And again, inelastic collisions, we don't like literally have one object, but they're moving as if these two objects um, were, were one object. Um, 
The other thing to note on the graph is right here, both those objects are together. I didn't draw them right on top of each other to differentiate that we, we do still have two objects there, but you could draw those lines right on top of one another if you had to sketch this out, which you will not have to sketch out on the um, quiz. Right. And like I said, explosions are just the exact opposite. Even on the graph, we can see, oh, well, that's just, that's just these two graphs are just the reverse of one another. We started with um, an object that was moving as if it were one, and then for whatever reason, it split apart. You know, if we look at the dynamics cars or the dynamics um, vehicles in, in class or carts in class, we saw that they had a spring in between them. So you could take a couple of carts, put them next to each other, release the spring in between the two and they go and they go flying apart right so an explosion it might might mean that they're stopped to begin with they be, could be going at some sort of velocity to begin with either direction really doesn't matter we just know that we had one object to begin with and it splits apart into two objects to end with and it would get each one of those objects would get its own mv as well which i realized i forgot to write in there so this object would have its own momentum this object its own momentum and to begin with, we would have two masses combine to give me the total mass, and this whole thing would be traveling at one specific velocity. And again, that velocity could be zero or it could be something else. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at putting this into practice then. Finish writing that off here as well. All right, so with number four. What's the momentum of a red ball with a mass of 0.25 kilograms and it's moving at 1.4 meters per second? Well, we know our formulas. One of them is the formula for impulse. The other one we already wrote there is the formula for momentum. And the final formula is Ft equals m change in v. Or that could be re rewritten to Ft equals m v final minus v initial. Right. In this case, I've only got one, one velocity, and it's not asking me to find a different velocity. So this formula is, is out of the question right away. Uh, we don't have enough information for force or time, so that one doesn't work either. That equation in the, in the middle there doesn't work either. All right, so then we're just left with the standard momentum formula, which is just mass and velocity. Well, we got a mass, we got a velocity, we got a mass, we got a velocity. Go ahead and multiply the two out, and we get 0.35 kilogram meters per second. Remember, kind of a weird, kind of a weird unit is kilogram meters per second, but that's because mass is in kilograms, velocity is in meters per second. So when I multiply kilograms times meters per second, I get literally kilograms times meters per second. We could even have a, you know, time symbol in between the two of those um, sort of sub units so to speak all right so now let's go ahead and put our um, types of collisions formulas into play here with number five and six so five this one can be traditionally one that gives students somewhat of an issue just because of i think how the problems worded not necessarily that it's any harder than anything that we've seen in class before but uh, it tells us if the ball from the previous problem, so that means we, we got to go up and see, oh, the, the ball that they're talking about in the previous problem was this red one, and we already knew its mass and its velocity, or you could say we already knew its momentum overall. Um, so you don't necessarily have to put down the mass and velocity here since we do know the full momentum. You could have gone straight to this step that I'm circling right there. All right. Um, personally, I like to write out the full thing just to be really clear where we're getting the numbers from and to show that our mass hasn't changed. So here we, we know that we've got a, a mass of 0.25 to begin with, again, because that's from the, the previous problem that I'm dropping in there. Um, we also know that, that that ball, we're going to assume that that ball doesn't change its you know, shape or size or anything like that, its mass. So it's still going to be 0.25 after the collision. You know, it doesn't tell us that, but we know, okay, if you knock a ball into another one, chances are it's not like splitting apart or sticking together or something like that. Um, the other ball it tells us is... 0.12 kilograms, so that's where I'm getting the 0.12 from. Same reasoning here, we know that that mass is not going to change. Um, so we can get both of those masses accomplished um, right to begin with. 
And then let's go ahead and throw the rest of it in here. So it says, hits a blue ball with a mass of 0.12 kilograms, which is initially at rest. That's big, that means to begin with, that ball is at zero meters per second. And then the blue ball ends up gaining a velocity, so the blue ball gains a velocity of 0.8 meters per second. Well, if it gained a velocity, it means, well, that's after the collision, right? That's the, the collision is the thing that caused it to gain. And remember, the equal sign essentially represents our collision. Um, so gaining would be after that. Blue ball was the one that had the mass of 0.12, so it's going to get a velocity of 0.8 from above. Okay. And then it does ask us in the end, well, what is the new velocity of the red ball. So that's unknown, right? That's what, uh, that's why we have that as just a, a V by itself or your X, whatever you want to call that. And the other thing that uh, the problem doesn't tell us is the velocity of the red ball is 1.4 to begin with. Again, that's coming up from the, from the problem above. I guess I should say coming down from the problem above, right? Right? So then at this point, don't think of this as, especially if you're somebody that you feel like you're not super confident with your math skills, don't think of this as multiple, you know, or, or one long problem, think of it as multiple, just little tiny ones, right? To begin with, all I care about is 0.25 times 1.4. I'm just going to pretend like the rest of this doesn't even exist, get my little sub answer for that, and then I'm moving on to the next part here. Just look at this part alone, and again, kind of think, okay, this stuff doesn't even exist. I only care about 0.12 times 0, get that answer. And do the same thing for after the equal sign is as well. You know, pretend, okay, this doesn't even exist, this doesn't even exist. The only thing I care about is this next little piece of the puzzle. And then finally, just care about that last piece. Pretend like the rest doesn't even exist. All right, so then when we get to that point, say, okay, well, 0.25 times 1.4, that gave me the 0 0.35. 0 0.12 times 0 is going to give me 0. And the other side of things, we can't do anything with the V, so it's just 0.25V. And then to very, on the very end here, we should expect a really small number, right? Because we're dealing with something 0.12 that's like, it's around a tenth almost, right? 0.8 is also kind of around, is, is much less than one, right? It's eight tenths. So when we're multiplying something like eight tenths by something that's almost one tenth, you're gonna come up with a really small number. So this 0.096, it makes sense. And that's almost insignificant the amount of momentum that we have um, there, 0 0.096. You know, if we were to round that to one decimal place, it would just be 0.1. Uh, so not very much at, um, at all. All right, so then we can go on from here. You don't necessarily have to show this sub-step here. You could have just shown this since the zero doesn't do much for us. Uh, you didn't even have to really worry about it. I like showing more steps just to be really clear. Um, with my, my own work, though, even if this were something that I was doing on my own and not teaching it, I would still like to show the, the additional steps just to really show where my thought process is coming from. So now we're at that point, right? We got our 0.35 by adding 0.35 plus zero. The other stuff I just dropped down. I uh, said, let's deal with it later. So now at this point, this is that later, I want to combine my like terms, right? Remember, combining like terms is if you have numbers that have variables by them you can add those as long as the variables are the same if you got numbers without any sort of variable then you can't uh, you can't add them that with something that has a variable so like 0.25v and 0 0.096 that doesn't fly we cannot uh, we can't add those because they are just not like terms so we've got to be able to somehow get 0.35 and 0 0.096 together now how do we do that we could either subtract 0.35 and get it on the right making that whole side zero, or makes more sense to get rid of the 0 0.096 so we can get closer and closer to getting V by itself, because that's really in the end what we want to do. So if we back up a second, you can say, well, you know, what's the first thing that I want to do here? Well, here's V, let's get rid of anything that's not associated with V. So 0 0.096 makes the most sense. Uh, how do you get rid of it? Well, if it's being added, do the opposite, subtract it, right? And just like anything else in algebra, do it, do it to uh, both sides. All right, so that's where this step ends up coming into play. That cancels, and then 0.35 minus uh, 0 0.096, again, because I'm doing it to, to both sides, gives me that 0.254.
So that's the next step that we're at. Right here, we come out with 0.254 equals 0.25v. Couldn't do anything with that quite yet. And again, I'm just getting closer and closer to getting v by itself. So I know I've said this in class like a million times now, but don't even worry about this side. We only care about how do I get v by itself. I don't care about any other number than what is associated with v. So the only thing associated with v is this 0 0.25, 0 0.25 times v. Right. So if I want to break multiplication or get rid of multiplication, do the opposite, which of course would be division. So we're going to divide by 0.25. And then this other side, we're going to divide by 0.25 as well. And then I look back on it and say, well, what, what is that point? Uh, what, what is that number that I'm dividing by 0.25? And it was 0.254. So we already know, like this answer is going to be really close to one because we're basically doing 0.25 divided by 0.25. You know, the number's just a little bit bigger. And even if you rounded this, right here to two decimal places, that would be fine. You'd get 0.25 divided by 0.25. So any number divided by itself is of course gonna give us one. In this case, we went to a couple more decimal places, 1.02 meters per second, good enough. All right. So number six it is. Uh, we're ice skating with our little brother here. We've got a mass of 70 kilograms, traveling at four meters a second. Our brother has a mass of 40 kilograms, traveling at three meters per second in the opposite direction. We already know by this point in the unit that that opposite matters a whole lot. So if I decided to call my velocity positive, well, then that means this opposite is going to be negative. That's not necessarily the, the most correct way. We could call our velocity negative, and that would make the opposite direction positive then. Doesn't matter which direction's which, as long as we're consistent with our thinking. Uh, so after colliding, we continue going forward, and, our, and it tells us how fast is your brother going. So assuming that, well, if he's not going the same speed as us, that must mean that it's not an inelastic collision. It must mean that it's an elastic collision. We have two separate um, people still at this point. Right? One didn't end up jumping into the other one's arms or something like that. Um, and then other than that, it's pretty much the same as the the previous problem, we're still solving for a velocity, still got a bunch of masses and, um, and velocities as well, or a whole bunch of momenta. Again, I would highly recommend not skipping this first step. That diagram is everything because that diagram tells you what your formula is. So in this case, we have you, right? Uh, we have our brother, we collide, we have you, we have your brother. All right. Um, we know our mass is 70 kilograms before and we're assuming after the collision. If it was different after the collision, that would be morbid. If you really understand physics, you know where I'm going with that. Um, we're traveling at four meters a second, so that's where this four meters a second is coming from. Our brother has a mass of 40 kilograms, so that's where our masses are coming from here. And he is traveling at three meters a second, so three meters a second right there in the opposite direction. So I just randomly chose my direction to be positive, so that means that my brother's direction is going to be negative there. All right, after colliding, we continue to go forward at one meter per second. So we chose initially for my direction to be positive so that means if I continue going forward, then this is still positive. So that's why I'm getting a, a positive here for the one. Of course, if there's no sign in front of it, we know that it's we know that it's positive. Now, had I chosen my direction to be negative to begin with, well, then that mean would mean if I continue to go forward, well, my forward is negative. So I would end up having to change this one to a, a negative as well. All right. But in this case, that's not the that's not the case. All right. And we want to know how fast is our brother going, so V. All right, from there, we could start combining things. This is another This is another great example where just use mental math. You know, 7 times 4 would be 28, so 7D times 4 would be 280. Uh, 4 times negative 3 would be negative 12. It's 40, so tack on another 0. And then we can still do the same thing on the other side. 70 times 1 is no big deal. 40 times V, also no big deal. Start combining your like terms. This one's a little bit easier than the last one because our like terms are already on the on the same side together, at least to, to begin with here. 
Uh, so I end up with 160 equals 70 plus 40 V. So that's the step that we would get um, had we been solving this uh, from, from scratch here all along. And I wanted to have everything sort of pre-done for us just so that this video didn't end up becoming like a five-hour video. It's going to be long enough already. All right, so then at that point, we can go ahead and um, start getting closer to V, right? Pretty much take care of anything that's not associated with V, so get rid of the 70 here if we do it to one side. Do it to the other, we're left with 90 equals 40 V. That would be the next step. And again, don't worry about, like, what do I do with 90 and 40? Who cares? The math will tell us that. The only thing I care about is how do I get that V by itself? Well, currently it's being multiplied by 40, so do the opposite. If we do it to one side, do it to the other. And we're left with 90 divided by 40 equals 2.25. And even that would be an okay problem to do. Mental math in your head, practice, practice, practice as much as you can for that SAT coming up. And we cancel out those zeros and we'd end up with 9 divided by 4, which is the same thing as 9 divided by 2, which would be 4.5, and then divided by 2 again, which would be 2.25. And that's, of course, in meters per second. Moving on. So number seven. Uh, I miss teaching with Miss Mardoway in physics. It was really, really, really fun. So this is a nice throwback here. Uh, so you're catching a pass from Miss Mardoya, now Miss Venitza, if you had her before. The 0.4 kilogram ball is traveling at 22 meters a second. So I'm just going to jump right down to the, the problem here. Um, we know that the ball is 0.4 kilograms. Uh, we know that it's traveling at 22 meters per second. All right, but then it says we have to jump forward to catch it. So that's what we got going on over over here. If we're jumping forward and the ball is coming at us, well, then the ball has to be negative or we have to be negative. I just randomly chose for our velocity to be, to be negative. Um, and again, because we're going in opposite directions there. And it says at 5 meters a second to catch that ball. Um, our mass is 72 kilograms. And then afterwards we catch the ball. So this is an inelastic collision because we, um, me and the ball, we were traveling as if we were two separate objects to begin with. I catch it, well now it's in my, my hands, it's, it's on my person, so it contributes to my mass over overall. We have to add those two together because now they are traveling as if they were one object. Of course they're still two separate objects, but they're traveling as if they were one. Right, both masses travel at the same velocity. It's moving like it's one object. All right, so that's where I'm getting this step from. This is the only thing new from the previous two problems, although we have seen it a bunch in class and a bunch in um, the uh, practice packet. If you don't know what I'm talking about with that, make sure to take a look at pages two through seven, some of those videos, or back in your notes. That'll help out a ton. But uh, we got 72 plus 0.4 because we've got our mass plus the football, because that's exactly what's happening. we got our mass plus the football since we're holding it. So then from there, I can go ahead and start solving some stuff out. 0.4 times 22 gives me that. 72 times negative 5 gives me that. And 72.4, right, because those are combined, times V gives me that. Just like before, combine those like terms, get that V by itself. You got 4.85 in the end. Go a little bit quicker on that one since we've seen that in problems five and six. So if you are jumping um, ahead to problem seven and you didn't see the other two, make sure to take a look at the contents so you can go back to um, problems five or six where I explain how to isolate those variables a little bit more in detail. All right, uh, problem eight. So I got the tennis ball cannon. Um, it is initially at rest. And then it says when it's uh, when it's fired, it gets launched at 10 meters a second. Cannon travels backwards, and what is the um, the mass of the cannon without the ball? All right. So to begin with, uh, we've got our cannon and tennis ball together. That's a really crappy drawing of a tennis ball, but that's a tennis ball. Just go with it. All right. So those two are together, meaning that uh, my masses are going to be combined. They're going to both be traveling at the same velocity. All right, it doesn't matter what the velocity is. In this case, it's zero, but it's, it's still the same velocity. On the opposite side of things here, again, the equal sign sort of represents where the either collision or interaction took place. In this case, the interaction is not a collision. It's an explosion. 
uh, in this case actually a literal explosion where something is being blown out of um, the, the cannon. So we've got our cannon plus our tennis ball in the end. All right, so each one would have its own momentum. In some cases, I'd recommend, you know, and it, this is just a slightly different way of doing this problem, uh, just to show you that there are other, other ways out there. You can kind of record keep along the way and say, well, what's my, what's my velocity? What's my mass for each one of these pieces of the, of the puzzle? So I'd have another velocity here that I'm dealing with. I don't know my mass. On the other side of things, I do know my velocity. I do know my, um, I, I do know my mass there. Right. So with inelastic collisions, we know that we've got one object to begin with or something that's traveling as if it were one object. In this case, it's at rest. So that's where we're getting the zero from, which really means I don't even care about anything inside of this parentheses because it's going to be time zero anyway. But for the sake of clarity in the problem, I wanted to make sure that we, we do have the mass uh, really clear where that's coming from. We have it really clear that uh, we don't know the mass of the cannon, so that's why I've got the M like that. So this can be something that's a little bit of a challenge. If this were a velocity of anything other than zero, well now we got a little bit more of an issue. We'd have to distribute to each one of these terms, which technically we'd still have to do, but because it's going to be times zero anyway, it's just going to be zero plus zero in the end, which will still give us zero, of course. The other side of things, nothing new, right? m times negative 0.4 would be negative 0.4m, or leave it as m times negative 0.4, either way. Uh, and then we have 10 times 0 0.06. Resist the urge for the calculator. Multiplying by 10 is the same thing as moving your decimal place one to the right. So that's where we get this 0 0.6 from. Isolate, and you've got your uh, mass of 1.4, sorry, 1.5 kilograms. Right. And again, if you're just coming in now to the to this problem, you fast forward it. If you need to see how we isolated any of those variables, take a look at problems five or six. All right, so nine. Kind of skip the math for a second here. If we're jumping from the roof of our house, why would we rather land on a bunch of pillows instead of your driveway? Uh, don't try it at home. So we know that we've got to use the terms time and force, which is really important, right? Because really, the thing that changes momentum is impulse. Right? Impulse is a change in momentum. Well, impulse is also force times time. We know that a change in momentum is generally a change in velocity. So we can set these two equal to one another. We could say, well, if impulse is a force times a time, and that is the thing that changes our momentum, when anywhere where I see a change in uh, P, I can insert M times change in V in its place. Or if I saw M times change in V, I could insert change in P in its place. So in this case, we end up with this formula helps us quite a bit in our explanation. So where I say momentum change, the momentum change due to stopping is the same, no matter what, well, that's, that's true, right? We're our mass and our velocity when we hit the ground or hit the pillows, that's going to be the same because you're jumping from the same height and we're assuming we're the, we're the same person. We wouldn't say like, well, what's the difference between one person jumping into pillows versus a different pillow, uh, different person jumping out of the ground? Well, that's kind of crappy science. We're changing multiple variables at once. So the same person falling from the same height or jumping from the same height, they're going to have the same momentum no matter what. So if our momentum stays the same, so change in P stays the same, then what does that mean for our time and force? Well, that means either you want to increase your force, and that's going to decrease your time, or if you were to decrease force, that's going to increase your time. So the whole purpose of jumping into to pillows, aside from common sense, tells us it's a much softer landing. Well, why is it a softer landing? Well, that's because the amount of force that's acting on us is really small because it takes us longer to change our momentum when we squ squish a pillow. Right? It's going to take a longer time for us to come to a stop. Longer time to come to a stop is going to equate to much less force acting on our body 
and of course much less force acting on our body basically means a lot less room for injury right so the last couple here made it this far congrats so number 10 uh, golfer hits a 0 0.05 it should say kilogram golf ball that's a little bit of a typo there uh, it's initially at rest and it acquires a speed of 62 meters per second all right tells us that the club was in contact with the ball for 0 0.0004 seconds so four ten thousandths of a second which is a really short amount of time so we should realize even though this golf ball doesn't have a large mass because that time is so small we should expect there to be somewhat of a large force here all right uh, and it asks us what is that what is that force all right so in this case um, we know that we could go with one of three formulas, and really we could rearrange them to, to give us a whole bunch of other formulas as well. Um, and we've got our Ft equals m change in v, or v final minus v initial as we have it written. Uh, so we can go through here and start seeing, well, how, how can I narrow this down? All right, so we hit a 0 0.05 kilogram golf ball, so right away, we realize, okay, the impulse equation, that's out of the out of the picture because it just it doesn't have anything to do with mass, at least not directly. Behind the scenes, it it, it does, but we're not going to get into that. Uh, it's initially at at rest, so we have a velocity. It acquires a speed of 62 meters a second, so we've got another velocity right there. So now, as soon as we know we've got two velocities, well, that's we're looking at a change in velocity then. All right, which is the same thing as um, v final minus v initial. So we've got two velocities, two velocities. So that right away tells us we're going with this formula. If we missed that, we could still say, well, the club was in contact with the ball for 0 0.0004 seconds. So we do know that it also has time in it, which this formula also has time in it momentum formula doesn't. So that's what narrows it down to the formula that I used for the answer key here. Um, we don't know the force, right? That's the whole point of this problem. What is the force? That's what we're looking for um, of the swing. So we do know our time. We already said it's this really, really, really small period of time. Uh, we also know that our mass is 0 0.05, so that's where I'm getting this this mass is 0 0.05, again kilograms, and then we know that this is always final minus initial, really common error to make is to reverse things when um, when it's something like our final velocity that is zero, because everybody wants to do like a larger number minus zero, in this case this is correct, because the larger number is the final velocity, but a lot of cases it is it is reversed. So make sure that you keep that in mind. We've always got an initial velocity at the end, final velocity to begin with, because that's what gives us our change in velocity. All right. So you wouldn't have to necessarily show this part here as two steps. I do it again just for um, trying to be as clear as possible, even if I were not teaching this and doing it on my own. But it's up to you. So then we end up with. 0 0.05 times 62 gives us that 3.1. Again, mental math would be really good here. You know, how can I do 0 0.05 times 62? Well, you might not be able to do that, but we do know that 0 0.5 times 62, well, it's just half of 62. That would be 31. But um, it's not 0.5, it's 0 0.05. So we would end up moving our decimal place one over to the, uh, to the, um, left in this case. So that'd be over there and we end up with 3.1. If that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, then use the calculator, but just try to do as much mental math as possible. Um, and then in the end here, we come out with uh, 3.1 divided by 0 0.0004. So again, that's going to be a really small number because we're dividing by 10,000th. So it's the same thing as multiplying by the 10,000th place. All right. So then uh, last one here, cars moving with a momentum of 37,500, again, weird unit, kilogram meters per second. And we wanna know what's the, what uh, force do the brakes need to exert to stop the car in two seconds? 
so at first it seems like it's it's kind of weird because it's like well, we've got this other formula here that um, we, we don't have all of our um, our variables ready to go right so if we did do this from the beginning here um, again we know that we've got formula for impulse we've got a formula for momentum we have a formula for the impulse change in momentum theorem which is really just a fancy way of saying this formula that I'm writing right here GV final minus V initial apologize for the tablet kind of messing up there but um, we, we'd look at this and realize okay well 37,500 kilogram meters per second like oh that's that's a momentum that I'm dealing with uh, what force do the brakes need to exert in two seconds? So we've got a time, we've got a force. So right away we could say, well, wait a second, I've got I've got a time and I've got a force. So this formula seems like we're in pretty good shape. I have a time, I have a force over here. So this formula seems like it's in in pretty good shape as well. So we have to realize uh, we could either start with the F T equals M change in V, right? That is our impulse change in momentum theorem or we could realize that 37,500 kilogram meters per second of a change in momentum is also a 37,500 unit in this case Newton second um, impulse why because impulse is the thing that causes a change in momentum so that's where I am getting this this change in P from this change in momentum from Another way to look at this is to say, well, this 37,500, if that's my momentum, my change in momentum, well, what's part of that change in momentum? It's, it has to do with mass and velocity. We don't know them separately, but we do know that it's mass and it's velocity, whatever this object is, in this case a car, contributed to that 37,500 um, change in, in velocity. All right, so what would that um, what would that look like then, sort of logic-wise? So we started with our F T equals m change in v, our impulse change in momentum theorem. I uh, started putting some stuff in. Said, okay, well, I know I'm looking for force. I know my time. And then basically what I did is I said, well, this m change in v thing. That's this over here. Well, that is my change in momentum. Why the negative? Well, because we started with a momentum of 37,500. We ended with a momentum of zero. How do we know that? Because the car is moving, so it has a momentum, it told us. And then it said it is stopping. Well, that's going to end up being zero kilogram meters per second. How do I know that without knowing the mass of the car? doesn't matter what my mass is. My velocity is going to be zero. So m times zero is going to be zero. So we've got a change in momentum of negative 37,500. The negative means I've lost 37,500 units of um, momentum. All right? So this one's a little bit of a hard one, not mathematically, but uh, conceptually. It's just, it's weird all right it's a weird way to think about the problem so then from there solve for force at this point it's a lot easier just divide by two and we're and we're done but again this part right here that can be a little bit of a challenge the biggest thing to realize is you can mix mix and mass mix and match excuse me those um, those units all right so I wish you the best of luck on the um, momentum quiz that will be coming up soon. If you need anything, obviously let me know. See ya.